in my office preparing for today, and the verdict came down. Many of you heard Alex Manassian found guilty of 10 counts of murder, 16 counts of attempted murder. You remember it was back in 2018, April the 23rd, 30 miles almost due south of us here, just off of Young Street. He drove a rented van 1.2 kilometers down the sidewalk to kill as many people as possible. He was convicted again of 10 counts of murder, 16 people were injured, 16 counts of attempted murder. Judge Ann Malloy put together a 68-page document centered around what the defense and their entire defense attempted to sell. And it was this, that Alex Manasseh was not criminally responsible for his attack due to a mental deficiency of autism. But the fact is, 28-year-old Manassian had fantasized about this particular crime for more than 10 years. He carefully, methodically planned his attack by first renting a van in order to commit his assault. Many opportunities to reconsider, don't you think? He had shown no remorse from the moment he was arrested to the moment he was convicted. No remorse for his victims, no remorse for the consequences of his actions. He actually wanted to kill 100 people that day. He wanted to be famous for what he did. I commend the judge for refusing to even mention his name in court. Called him John Doe. He sought to die by cop instead of facing up to a lifetime jail sentence. And when asked if he would do it again, he said he would only he would hope to get closer to his 100 mark. The defense argued he had a personality flaw. He had a personality flaw. I want to just pause that. I'll come back to that at the end. The story is so relevant. I want to talk today about personality. You know, you, you have the expression, boy, we have personality. That person has personality. You, we've used that as an expression, and it's not inaccurate to say that. We all have unique personality. We probably don't realize how unique our personality really is. DNA molecules united together in such an infinite number that the uniqueness of each of us, now get this, the uniqueness of each of us based on our DNA uniqueness, our DNA's uniqueness is 10 to the power of 2.4 billion. Now that number just like, okay, that's, I don't understand it. So let me help you. This is how I have to understand 10 to the power 2.4 billion is your uniqueness. If you were to take 2.4 billion zeros, each zero comprised, and if you had a slip of paper and you put a zero that was an inch wide and you had each zero an inch wide, 10 to the power of 2.4 billion, your zeros of your uniqueness, your zeros would go on for 37,000 miles. 10 to the power of 2.4 billion. It's your uniqueness. There's no one like you. Now, don't turn to somebody and say, thank God for that. <laughs> no one like you. Not even identical twins. Don't come near to being alike. I mean, physical appearance and some of the chromosomes are similar, but beyond that, their DNA is just galaxies apart. 
We are uniquely made. Our DNA is uniquely made. God broke the mold when he made each one of us. And it's obvious God loves variety, doesn't he? He loves variety. Just look around. Look around at the people in the room. There's variety here. He created us a unique combination of personalities. Oh, but that personality thing gets us into trouble, though. We're all so unique, and that uniqueness was meant to be a blessing, but the enemy has turned it into a curse. Bible gives us plenty of proof that God loves all types. Peter was a sanguine. Paul was a choleric. Jeremiah was melancholy. You take all 12 of the disciples, no wonder there was such conflict among them. They were so unique in their personalities. Now, there's no right, there's no wrong temperament of personality. We need all kinds of personality. We need all kinds of flavor. We create together just the right flavor. Your personality will affect how you operate in everything we've been talking about the last few weeks when it comes to doing life together. Your personality affects how you do that. Your personality. And I wanted to take today to talk about personalities. Because two of you can have this identical giftings. Two of you can have identical abilities, but you will operate so differently. And one of the biggest things that I, and I've been saying this a lot in the last few weeks when I've been talking to people about their abilities and giftings, is one of the biggest things we have to do is do not compare yourself to others. you got to resist it. Because our natural tendency, we live life comparing ourselves. Everything is comparison, right? Grades are on comparison. Everything, competitions, comparison. But when it comes to how God has made you, we've got to stop the comparison thing. Because it falls short at that point. No, we need to instead learn from each other. Allow others' personalities to help you grow. Don't begrudge their unique personality. This is actually quite big. This is a big deal. And James 1 is our text. And I want to read through James 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Note this part. When any trouble comes your way of any kind, and guess what? It's going to come through people. When people problems come your way, it's an opportunity for joy. It's an opportunity for joy. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put childish things away. We've been discussing how God is developing our shape. Now, before our visual person puts on the acrostic for shape, I want to see if you're, how you're doing with remembering what shape stands for. And so we're going to start this. Oh, no, we already... Th- okay, that's for me. I may hope it's not up for you. Perfect. Okay, so... Not, don't look back, don't look back. Look up, look up, look. Don't cheat, no cheating, no cheating. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I can see you. There's so few of you. I can see every one of you. Okay, so here we go. Um, S stands for what? Spiritual gifts. Good, thank you. Spirit, we talked about that last week, the spiritual gifts. God has given each, all of us, spiritual gifts, unique spiritual gifts for you. Again, go back to last week, review... H stands for heart. And heart, it has to do with your passion. It has to do with what stirs you deeply. You're stirred deeply about certain things. God, God did that to you. <laughs> God did that to you. And that's a good thing. A stands for abilities. You were born with abilities. God gave you abilities from birth. P stands for Personality, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if you stumbled on that one, I'll give that to you. Personality, we're going to be talking about personalities because personality is a huge, huge part of how God is shaping us. Now, I want you to note that part. Personality, he's given you your unique DNA. He's given you your personality, but now you need to allow him to shape it. Personalities are one of those things that are deeply shaped. Personality, and the E stands for, anyone? 
experience. Next week, that's next week, experience. Based on our experience, based on what has brought you to this moment, your past, your history, your, your case history, if you would, will help you to be able to build on what God wants to do today and tomorrow. So let's talk about the P part. And again, I come back to the scripture found in James 1, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, I'm going to put add in here because it's, it's, when troubles come of any kind through people, through other personalities, consider it an opportunity for great joy. If it weren't for them, you wouldn't have great joy. You need them they're the troubles, to develop your personality for great joy. Okay, you're, you're looking at me, you know, your gla- everybody's glasses just fogged all, just right there. Uh, so let me talk about how we do this together. Let's start with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, first persons God created. They had true connected, you know, they were the most united people the earth ever had. I've always discovered the smaller the group, the more united you are. The bigger you are, the less united you are. And so here they were, husband and wife, unique personalities God gave them. Again, he has developed their shape, personalities, part of their shape. And they were placed in the Garden of Eden, and they were given many privileges. All went well. God told them, by the way, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tempter came. They sinned. They hid from God, covered themselves up, and neither would take responsibility. Now therein becomes the journey. Neither took responsibility for a broken relationship. And as a result, you and I continue the trend today, some 6,000 plus years later, of reflecting or deflecting responsibility when it comes to our personality and others in relationship. We're doing it over and over again. I want to share three points. Point number one, you were made to need relationships. Now, this message is timely, is it not, for our day of pandemic? You were made to need relationships. The moment you were born, your relationships began. It began with mom and dad, or whoever were your caregiver. Your relationship began with them, and there was a give and take in relationship. Then, as you got a little bit older, your relationship moved on to your siblings. You had sibling relationships. Then your relationship moved on to maybe daycare, moved on to Sunday school, children's relationship, moved on to school relationships. Then as you continued to grow, it was friendships. It was workplace relationships. For some of you, husband and wife relationships. We begin to move through relationships in life. When, not if, relationships become strained, There is a tendency for us to do a number of things when it comes to relationship. All of them are which a reflection or a deflection in order to dance around that relationship when friction comes. Again, I say when, because it will. Why? Because we have unique DNA 10 to the power of 2.4 billion. It happens. And it doesn't simply mean that everybody in this world but you is an idiot. It means, I come back to that scripture, when troubles of people of any kind come your way, it's an opportunity for great joy. You were made for relationships. Now, specifically, Adam and Eve were created for three relationships. With others, with themselves, with God. This also comes out of the passage where a Pharisee approaches Jesus. And a Pharisee asks Jesus a question in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. He asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So we actually here at Cornerstone, our vision statement, the first Third of our vision statement here, we, our vision statement is love, grow, serve. First part of it, love, that part of it is loving God and loving others. It comes out of the first commandment. It comes out of this. And so when Jesus answered the question, he said here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, 
And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. So then flows out of love for others. Now, here's the part I want to get you to recognize here for this moment. It says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind. Love your neighbor as what? As yourself. There's a third one in here. It's you. How well do you know you? Love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting that Jesus would say that, don't you think? Why didn't he just say, just love on people? Mm -mm. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. How well do you love yourself? Now, I don't mean, you know, that you're cocky and arrogant and your head's too big, can't get through doorways. Not that kind of self-love. But do we understand ourselves well enough in a self-love, a godly self-love, because if we don't, then our relationship with others is all messed up. Might I propose to you today that many relationships have gone south because we don't know how to deal with stuff going on right here? If this is a mess, if this is a mess inside of you, it's going to be a mess when you try to care for someone else. You following with me? So if this is messy, that's messy. He says, love your neighbor as yourself, and if you've got a messy stuff going on with yourself, it's going to be a messy love with your neighbor. That's what Jesus was sharing. So let me just talk about that. You have relationships with others. Now, this is a no-brainer. Friends, neighbors, teammates, small groups, on and on and on. Yet when something goes wrong in that relationship, there's a quick tendency to blame the other. Adam and Eve did this, and we've been doing it ever since. We call it the blame game. Something goes wrong, and we blame them. It's them. Here's their problem. But I want to make a suggestion here that let's, you can't change them. You can only change you. So what needs to change in here? This is where we're talking. Personality. Personality. How do I change? Because if I change, if I live a life changing, then that changes out there. But that all goes toxic and it goes bad and relationships are broken and severed and wounded because this is refusing to change. So in the relationship, and we all have a relationship with others, What's where the problem lies within? I mean, think about it. Think about how this works. If someone says something to you that you know just isn't true, if they say something about you that you know just isn't true, it's really not going to be a problem. Because you know right off the top it's just not true. No, you and I are hurt when people say something that does ring true. That's where the hurt comes in. I'll give an illustration. If you're six foot three, and someone calls you shorty. No reason for you to take offense. Because <laughs> you're not short. However, if that same person sarcastically calls you skyscraper, ooh, they've just triggered something in you. Because it has to ring true for it to offend you. It has to ring something in you for it to get under your skin. It triggers how you feel about you. How you feel about you. Remember Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So how do you feel about you? It triggers something when there's an insult that you know does ring true. And it hits something. I want to just say God can transform this ability and how we see ourselves into his likeness and his image. So you have a relationship with others. You have a relationship with yourself. And made mention of that and... and I come back to the question, do you like yourself, <laughs> okay? Do you accept yourself? Do you forgive yourself? Before you're too quick to understand, I'm going to go through a list here in just a moment because it's in this list that there are millions of people around the world who make their living off of it. Therapists, counselors, who make their living, and I'm not saying it negatively, who make their living in trying to help to understand what's going on in here. Because out there I can't control. But I can. This is my territory to control. You have a relationship with yourself. And thirdly, you have a relationship with God. 
We need to be able to help see ourselves the way God sees us. Uh, We showed that clip a few weeks back. You are God's masterpiece. How does he see you? So the first point I want to share, you were made to need relationships. Here's point number two. You have the capacity to choose how your relationships with others will progress. You choose to stay stuck. You also choose to work through your problem. You choose to hold on to those hurts or you choose to find freedom. You choose to hurt the other person who hurt you, but it's your choice. You can choose to run when things get dicey. Your choice. Adam and Eve neither chose to take responsibility. Both chose to run and then they chose to blame. Again, we're talking about God's transformation of our personalities. Now, here the, here's a list. and This is the part I'm going to invite you. If you have your cameras, you can take a picture. of. We're going to put this list up here. And it's a list of 15 things. And this is a mention. This is where we're going to, this is where it triggers us. These are our bruises. So here's a list of, uh, I, I just put a list. We call them inner core pain. And we've all got some of them. Inner core pain. I'm going to go through the list as quick. And I'm going to call, these are trigger points. These are points that often are hidden inside, but they will trigger things. And this therapy, and and you spend the rest of your life, I spend an exorbitant amount of time not focusing on these, but on certain ones of these because they're my bruise. And God's called me to be transformed through these, to find healing. Here they are. Inner core pain or inner core fears, number one, is helplessness or powerlessness. This is where you feel no control. And if somebody pokes that bruise of helplessness, powerlessness, you will respond. Second, rejection. Like others are closing you out of their lives. Abandoned. You feel left behind. You were forsaken by a parent. You were forsaken by a caregiver. You were forsaken in a marriage. And whether there was a separation and a divorce and those If that happened, this will be knocking at your door. Or it could be you are still in the marriage, but you still feel abandoned in the marriage. Disconnected is number four. Disconnected from others. This will stir loneliness. Number five is failure. You feel like a failure constantly. And so you constantly are wanting to say or feeling the need to say sorry, 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 sorry you keep failing number six unloved as if no one could ever really love you because you're unlovable you must be unlovable number seven you're defective something is seriously wrong with you you just wish you were like them number eight core inner pain of inadequacy. You just don't measure up like others do. You just don't measure up. Nine, phony. You can't be you. You don't even know who you are, who you is. Number 10, inferior or belittled. That you always are below this acceptable standard and you just can never meet it. Number 11, cheated. Others constantly take advantage of you. 12, invalidated. As if your words mean nothing. No one listens to you. No one understands you. Your actions mean nothing. 13, unfulfilled. As if what is happening to you will lead to a dissatisfied life. This is all you've got. Number 14, manipulated. Others are trying to coerce you. They're deceiving you. And number 15, isolated. You're being ignored. You're isolated. Now there's entire therapy around all. All right, okay. Okay, that's, those are really big. That's why I said if you look at those, because I've, I'm well aware of these. 
And the question I'm asking you is, what is your core fears? They're there. Any disruption of relationships has been through a triggering of this. It's come down to somewhere in here. The ability to find transformation here is the ability to get healing and let God, you bring him into that. We do that through cleansing stream. We do that through uh, restoring the foundations ministry and all that. We, we come into this area and then bring Holy Spirit in there so that he rewrites our script so that we can live the way God created us to live in his image. We can see ourselves in that way and then it will flow out to the people around. We won't be so hurtful or negligent, or deflective, or running, or hiding, or whatever it might be, that it can flow in health. Let me give an example. This is a true story. I've changed the names. I'm going to call them Bill and Brittany. But it's a true story, though. Bill, his core fear is failure. Just going to set you up for the story. His core fear is failure. Brittany's core fear is invalidation. They're married to each other. Bill's failure, Brittany's Invalidation. They have others, but those were big ones. So here's the story, true story. One night while Brittany's working late, Bill was bored. And since he loved to decorate the house, he decided to change the arrangements of their master bedroom furniture. He moved the bed, repositioned the knickknacks and their shelves, relocated the dresser, and generally gave the room a whole new look. Then he went to bed and turned out the lights. You see where this is going? When Brittany got home after he went to bed, she didn't switch the lights on because she didn't want to wake Bill. She tiptoed into the bedroom and immediately smashed her shin on a table that hadn't been there when she left for work. She tripped and she crashed into a pair of antique skis that were placed against the wall. The skis in turn tumbled onto a shelf containing all her beloved precious moment figurines, shattering her most treasured possessions. The combination of breaking glass, falling objects, and screams awakened Bill. He bolted from bed, forgetting he had moved everything, and ran straight into the wall, bloodying his nose. Now, you got to admit, it's not a typical night. When the lights came on, again, true story. When the lights came on, they began shouting at each other. You could imagine. Brittany criticizing Bill for moving the furniture without first talking with her about it. Her angry words made Bill feel what? Like a failure. She triggered. Bill defended his actions, and his words made her feel invalidated. You don't really matter. I didn't bring you into this. The shouting, sarcasm, blaming, it ran on for a while. Psychologists call it the fear dance, the fear dance. You're poking each other's triggers, and you're into an argument. And it was in full swing. And it all happens through these particular buttons, okay, called the fear buttons. In community... People help reveal your core fears. We don't think we have them until somebody pokes them. And then we react. I need people. You need people. Again, we come back to that if we are to experience the greatest joy, then it's going to come through the troubles of others. And it's going to come them poking and you getting into that fear dance because things have been activated inside of you that God is saying see this I can transform this I can heal this others will help you help reveal your core fears but in essence others also give you a choice for a better course of actions that allow you to come into healing of your fears God is shaping your personality and he does it through others You make the choice to grow. You make the choice to find healing. You make the choice to be a blessing. It's a choice. It's a choice. We need each other. You have a choice about how you react when someone pushes your fear button. No one else controls how you think. No one else controls how you react. You and I alone have that decision to make. We are responsible for our own choices.
So important. Let me give you another example. Suppose you're walking down Young Street, Aurora. Some guy comes up you never met before, don't know him from anyone, calls you a disgusting name. What do you do? Now, I hope you'll act Christian like. Probably nothing, just keep walking. However, if a co worker whom you work closely with calls you that same name, they've just pushed your button. Now, what's the difference between the two people? The name calling itself didn't create the button. The button's there in both cases. In the second instance, the name calling tapped into the fear of rejection, failure, disconnection. It poked a fear based on a relationship. The closer the relationship, the more it will find it. I can't control others, but God has given me his Holy Spirit strength to control my choices. God is shaping our personalities. I want to close with these three steps. Three steps on how to respond. Step number one, take captive your thoughts and bring them into obedience. Easier said than done, granted. But being done, yes, it can happen. Take captive your thoughts and bring them into obedience. When you focus your attention on what the other person is doing, you are taking away your own power. When you rehearse their words, you've just reduced your own ability to conquer this. So stop doing that. Begin to think about you. When that triggers something, begin to think about yourself. Focus on what you're doing. Focus on, focus on what your thoughts are going through your head right now. Remember, those thoughts have not yet manifest themselves in action. That's where the victory is. Focus on what's going now on in your head. What did it just bring to the surface? And what is your reaction? Focus on that. I was praying a short while ago, and I was... Uh, in, I was actually here at the church. I was just, I don't know if I was in the sanctuary or in the foyer. And I was praying uh, by myself. And I was fretting over a situation. And strongly, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said this, Son, you have no control, or, you have no control over that. But what you can control is what you are now feeling right inside. Give this to me and watch me do the work. It was so strong. And I remember so strong I remember, and I don't often remember those ones. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Philippians 4 8. Brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think. Let this be your thoughts. Think about such things. Not them, but what's now triggered inside you. You are not at the mercy of those who push your buttons. They do not have control over how you react. We call this in psychology, we call it the power of one. You have the power of one. It's yours. It's mine. With the help of God, yes, this is, he has to transform this. I used to think that traffic made me angry. I'm not particularly a gracious per person in, in thick traffic. I used to think traffic made me angry, but it doesn't. Traffic doesn't make me angry. I have the power to take personal responsibility for my reactions to that stalled car that is causing all the lanes to be jammed up. I am responsible for how I feel about that. And until we take onus, Adam and Eve, go back to Adam and Eve, until they take responsibility, you're going to deflect. It's a problem. Number one, take captive your thoughts. Secondly, don't look to others to make you happy. Philippians 4.19, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Didn't say your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your employer. Didn't say someone else. My God will meet my needs. My fulfillment is emphatically not the job of any other person on this earth. They do not fulfill me. Only God can meet my needs. I must see God behind it. In our sod discipleship group this week, we, were, we heard a story about a, uh, a man, and, and, and Lori and I know him. He tells the story of where he was driving one day, and on the road in front of him there was this dove standing on the road. He's scooting at highway speed, and he thought the dove sees him. The dove will fly away, move. He kept driving. Dub didn't move. He kept driving. Dub didn't move. And all of a sudden, boom, feathers everywhere. 
I remember he told that story. The church we were in, he told that story. He's the author of this book. He told the story, and you saw everybody's mouth open. Like, you bird killer. <laughs> Feathers everywhere. And he felt horrible. Why didn't the dove move? So he went home, and it bothered him. He looked it up. It was a love dove. A love dove has a mate. And the love dove can't get their eyes off their mate. And they're stupid to everything around them. So this love dove probably had a mate off the side of the road and was, you've heard dove eyes? It's an expression, dove eyes. That's what it means. Your eyes are so fixed, you can't really see anything else going on. Church, that, what a picture. The Bible actually tells us to have dove eyes to God. That we so focused on Him that the things around us grow strangely dim. That we are so focused on him, our God. This is the picture. Don't look to others to make you happy. My God will meet all my needs. Abe Lincoln once said, quote, I reckon that people are about as happy as they make up their minds to be, end quote. Okay. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Take captive your thoughts. Secondly, don't look to others to make you happy. It's not up to them. It's yours. Number three, become the CEO of your own life. Become the chief executive officer of your own life. When did you become an adult? It's a good question. It's important not to answer that too quickly. There are some people, they're in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they're still not grown up. And there are some people who are 16, 17, 18 years old, and they're growing up. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, it was part of my text. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, when I grew up, I put childish ways behind me. How do you grow up? In the Lord. I put, he is shaping you. He's developing your shape, your personality. He is honing that personality through relationships. And in that development of personality, take captive your thoughts. Don't look to others to make you happy. That's yours. As Jesus said, love your neighbor, but you got to figure this out. And it will spend, you'll spend the rest of your life doing it. You won't just like arrive, but you'll be making progress. And be the CEO of your own life. James 1, 2, I come back to it. Dear brothers and sisters, when people troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. Mm. It will develop your personality. It develops mine. I want to close the service here by praying. You know, I, I would... This is the part I, I grieve over, that we can't come and gather at the front and lay hands and spend time together. This is the part I don't like. So here's what we'll have to do. We'll have to do it. We did this actually when, in pre-service when we were praying. We were praying for the worship team. We just put our hands towards them and prayed for them. And then they just were receiving it. Didn't touch. God doesn't have to have you touch somebody, I guess, does he? But we want to receive his touch this morning. And this passage, again, there's a lot to unpack. I know that in here. But I want to pray for each of us today before we go. Not just that we, that we heard something that was, oh, that was pretty interesting. You know, I like the story of Bill and Brittany. No, I just, that God help us now to be able to see where you want to heal in our lives. Mm-hmm.